Okay, welcome everyone to From Socialist Finance to Peripheral Financialization, the Yugoslav Experience, a conversation between Johanna Bachman and Fabio Matoli. Um, we are recording today, so uh, I just want to warn you that we are, so that you don't say anything that you wouldn't like to have recorded. <laughs> um, and the video will eventually show up on the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics website, and um, also on the website of Lefties, and I'll explain to you what that is in just a minute. So my name is Mary Taylor. I'm the uh, assistant director here at the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, but I'm welcoming you tonight uh, both as that, as well as um, a member of the editorial board of Lefties, which is a... Um, news and analysis online portal for um, critical politics in critical leftist politics in in Eastern Europe. Um, so uh, I am going to send around a just a little piece of paper that tells you a little bit more. It's just a kind of the front page of Lefties, which will allow you to figure out how to access it if you would like to online. Um, and if you'd like to uh, find out more about Center for Place, Culture, and Politics events, you can go to pcp.gc. Dot cuny dot edu or just search for Center for Place, Culture, and Politics. Um, on the front page of the, of the, uh, on the home page itself, in the upper left-hand corner, you can sign up to receive our newsletter, and then you'll find out about events there. Um, let's see, was there anything else? Oh, please help yourselves to wine and water. Don't be shy. We can find more if we run out. Um, it is conceived of a conversation, although each of our speakers will speak at us for a while first so that we can keep up with them. Um, so I think, is it, Johanna, you're going to speak first? Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm going to introduce both of you now and then Johanna will um, come up and speak for a bit. So Johanna Bachman is Associate Professor of Global Affairs and Sociology at George Mason University. She's the author of the book Markets in the Name of Socialism, The Left-Wing Origins of Neoliberalism, and the article Socialist Globalization Against Capitalist Neocolonialism, the Economic Ideas Be Behind the NIEO in Humanity. She's currently working on a socialist non-aligned bank on socialist non-aligned banks and globalization. I also want to comment that Johanna was core faculty uh, at the first summer school of six that is very closely related to lefties and its formation. Um, Fabio Mattoli is a graduate of the anthropology department here at the Graduate Center and is lecturer of anthropology at the University of Melbourne. His research focuses on the connection between finance, politics, and labor at the European periphery. Currently, he's working on a book manuscript titled Illiquidity and Power, the Economics of Authoritarianism at the Margins of Europe. So welcome. Okay, well... So thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And um, I'm going to say some controversial things. And so I'm very open to discussion about them. And I, uh, and I think that it could be very profitable for me, especially. So, oh, yeah, it's being recorded. I know I'm not going to reveal any like major uh, robberies or anything. So, <laughs> okay, so um, many popular and scholarly writers define globalization as the spread of neoliberal capitalism around the world. In this vision of, of globalization, uh, the main actors are Western European and American multinational corporations and banks. And in this view, financial globalization is seen as financialization. And financialization, and as many of the people in the room know, happens when companies and investors no longer seek to make money from production, but rather to seek to make money from money and financial speculation. So financial globalization and financialization are thus considered the key elements of current day globalization. Um, I agree that this is true. However, I argue that this financial globalization that we see right now is not really globalization at all, but rather resists globalization. And actually, financial globalization is not financialization, and actual financial globalization is impossible under capitalism. So I should, uh, I should briefly explain my understanding of globalization. Um, I take seriously uh, notions of globalization as a general process of creating an interconnected world. 
Um, so the it, most people, when they talk about globalization, they have a dual understanding. One is is that there's this that's it's neoliberal capitalism, and then the other one is is that oh we're all connected. And often students get confused and think that we have iPhones and therefore we're global. But so but there's this idea that, that interconnectedness is something def, def, um, defines globalization. And I want to take that seriously. The idea about an interconnected world. The Yugoslav economists I studied from the 1950s on didn't use the word global, but they used the word world economy. While they understood this world economy as capitalist before the Great Depression, from the 1950s, these Yugoslav economists saw the world economy as an emerging world-spanning economy that might potentially connect all countries and all people together. Um, and furthermore, according to their understanding, these connections would approach mutuality and equality. Uh, capitalists created all sorts of obstacles, especially the United States put, uh, produced op uh, created obstacles to this form of globalization. A global economy, as we know, doesn't just appear with deregulation, but actually requires some actual work. This is because of colonialism. Colonial economies of the 19th century and earlier connected the metropole with the colonies and limited connections between the colonies. As a result, colonies in different colonial economies did not have much connection with each other. Instead, all colonies had highly institutionalized connections with the metropole and uh, had a lack of institutional connections with each other. Um, so in order to move beyond colonial economies, it takes a great deal of work. Um, there needs to be a construction of institutions, policies, laws, social networks, trading relations, financial relations, and so on that might connect countries together with each other. Newly decolonized countries and socialist countries like Yugoslavia sought to forge new in, in institutionalized connections with their neighbors and with far flung countries in the hopes of creating new trading, production, and financial channels and relationships that might form what they called a new international economic order. So here I'm going to talk about how banks might have been part of this idea of creating a, so, a global socialist world. Socialist countries have always had banks. They had central banks. They had savings banks with local deposits. They had commercial banks and export banks. And Che Guevara was the director of the National Bank of Cuba. Uh, so what makes a, a socialist bank socialist? And what are the relationships between socialist banks and <clears throat> financial globalization? So today I'm going to talk about, just briefly, about economists' global consciousness. And I'll explain more about what I mean by that, just very briefly. And then I'm going to talk about one of three spaces where I see them trying to realize this global consciousness uh, one is the Yugoslav Bank for International Economic Cooperation, which I'll talk about today. The other is UNCTAD, and, um, and then also the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI. If you might remember, this bank was the most corrupt bank in the entire world. It was shut down by the British government and the U.S. government for money laundering and many other things, terrorism. Uh, but this is a, this is a, a, a began as a non-aligned bank. So I'm gonna, uh, that's part of my research. So these sorts of institutions sought to build a new global economy based on solidarity, as well as on money, markets, and prices, and it is an integral part of the new international economic order. So banking becomes socialist and decolonizing when it's in the service of production, export, solidarity, and radical democracy. So this idea of their global consciousness. In 1939, British socialist and economist H.D. Dickinson wrote, the beautiful systems of economic equilibrium described by Boom Bavirk, Wieser, Marshall, and Cassell are not descriptions of society as it is, but prophetic visions of a socialist economy of the future. These, um, these, so uh, this idea of what I'm talking about, these, these, these ideas here are the ideas of neoclassical economics. And these are neoclassical economics are the, as the mainstream has been since the 1930s in the United States. But neoclassical economics were also practiced by almost all the reformers in Eastern Europe who were also neoclassical economists. And many, many central planners in the Soviet Union, central planners around Eastern Europe were also neoclassically trained. So, um, so this is an interesting problem that this, uh, about the strange connections. So in, uh, in neoclassical economics, these models of economic equilibrium brought together equations describing an ideal economy in which production and consumption, or what we call supply and demand, were perfectly balanced without waste and without need, which meant that this economy was in equilibrium. So these... Uh, um, and then in, 19, in the 1950s, economists further proved mathematically that a perfect market equilibrium could exist on a worldwide scale in which every country 
could produce all goods and could participate equally in the world economy. That on a global scale, global production would equal, equal global consumption without waste or without need. This is a very radical view of the world, um, very different from the reality that existed in the 1950s. Capitalism's unbalanced wealth and monopolies made this ideal economic equilibrium and its global flows impossible. Many other famous economists realized that this equilibrium could be, uh, this sort of world economy and equilibrium could be realized by a central planner or could be realized by a free market. But these economists that I'm talking about uh, believed that there had to be other institutions involved. Whichever way you had it, you had to have socialist institutions. For these economists, socialist institutions, most importantly, the replacement of private property with social property was essential. And in the case of Yugoslavia, worker self-management was absolutely essential to make this system um, be, uh, to, to realize workers' power on a global scale. So in order to realize this utopian vision, there needed to be socialist institutions. There could be central planning, or they could be a market, or they could be a mixture in some way. Economists sought to realize these neoclassical um, models. These are, they knew they were very, very abstract. But they sought to realize them in the real world in various institutions they created. And this is going to be rather controversial. So they also uh, institutionalized these ideas um, as structural adjustment. Today, the term structural adjustment, of course, we know, is understood as the Washington Consensus, in which the World Bank and the IMF uh, required highly indebted countries to implement a range of reforms, privatization, trade, liberalization, and austerity to pay back their loans to the advanced capitalist world. However, economists, including economists in Yugoslavia, understood structural adjustment in a very different way. This was not the structural adjustment of the World Bank or the Washington Consensus in which each country had to adjust to the capitalist world system, but rather that this structural adjustment required that the entire world adjust together. Everyone had to change if one country changed. Thus, industries of the advanced industrial countries had to shift and be sent to other countries, uh, especially to the developing world. The endpoints of moving towards this new equilibrium this sort of new equilibrium world, mark, world economy might be centrally planned socialism. So there might be head, there's an idea you have to sort of try to head towards a new equilibrium. And this uh, would be, could be centrally planned socialism. Jan Timbergen, who won the Nobel Prize, believed that would be the case. Um, or it might actually be, um, a, you might move towards a system that has radical democracy and workers' power. This worldwide structural adjustment in the minds of economists would allow for maximum productivity, economic growth, and improved living standards on a national and global scale. This view of active universal structural adjustment had its origins in the Soviet Union and in Weimar Germany. Uh, this development process of moving to a new world equilibrium is not a linear movement of individual countries adjusting to each other. Uh, but rather adjusting to the world economy, but rather that all nations might jump together to a new, better world, um, and that this could be done uh, possibly instantaneously. This might happen through, for, in the minds of economists, might happen through world revolution or through international diplomacy in places like the UN. An essential part of this uh, moving to a new world equilibrium required massive investments. And these massive investments were part of a neoclassical idea from the 1940s that you have massive investment to have what they call a big push, the big push to the new equilibrium that will be a better, that will be a better new and international economic order. Yugoslav economists played a major role in promoting this idea of investments, especially if they were interested in new forms of international financial cooperation. Uh, one writer, uh, Lorenzini, has argued that the Comic-Con countries sought a socialist world economy in opposition to a capitalist economy. Uh, clap, so there was a, there was this, she, she talks about how the Comic-Con countries sought a socialist world economy in opposition to a capitalist world economy. And then they later came to embrace the capitalist world economy in the end. But from the 1950s, the Yugoslav economists sought not only to place Yugoslavia within the world economy, but they specifically spoke about a world economy without adjectives. This was a world economy that was going to be reshaped fundamentally. The difference between Comic-Con and the Yugoslavs can be explained by the historical decisions made by Yugoslav leaders 
after they got uh, expelled from the common form in 1948. The Yugoslav government turned to, as many people know here, to worker self-management, to the non-aligned movement, and they turned to the world economy to gain international allies and domestic legitimacy. One of the most famous Yugoslav economists involved with international uh, financial cooperation was Dragoslav Avramovic, who spent his life writing about international trade, the problem of debt, and solutions that could be gained through international financial cooperation. He developed these ideas in the early Yugoslav state, the socialist state. He also went on to work in the World Bank. He went then to work at UNCTAD and he went to work at the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, where he developed notions about a third world bank and a bank of the South. And then he returned to Belgrade in the 1990s as the governor of the Yugoslav National Bank. He was one of many Yugoslav economists working on projects uh, of financial cooperation around the world. Thus, the 1970s didn't bring the shock of the global like, uh, and, the, and the end of autarky because interdependence was the main aim of the, uh, the, main aim of the Yugoslav approach and the non-aligned movement. Yugoslavia was committed through 1989 to international economic and financial cooperation. So a concrete space where this vision, this sort of global vision that economists had was the Yugoslav Bank for International Economic Cooperation. On and and, I, and I'm, this research I just was doing back in Ju May and June, so I, I have not done a lot of research. I have not gone through my documents adequately. We're in the, in the middle of trying to figure out what was going on. So um, on January 1st, 1980, the, the Yugoslav Bank for International Economic Cooperation uh, began operations as a uh, non-aligned bank and as a socialist bank. Since 1956, the Yugoslavs had a commercial bank. It was called Yugobanka. Uh, Yugobanka, yeah, which uh, financed Yugoslav exports. And then in 1968, they formed another bank, uh, which also did export uh, credit, finance, credit, credit financing. Um, the new Yugoslav bank added a third task, which was international financial cooperation. And they formed the Yugoslav bank was formed because, uh, to realize the goals of the 1976 non aligned summit in Colombo, Sri Lanka. They were, the goal of, uh, the, in Sri Lanka was to the development of individual, national, regional, and international um, economic organizations which should contribute to achieving the policy of speeding up development of non-aligned countries and developing countries. The Yugoslav government formed the Yugoslav Bank for International Economic Cooperation to work with other organizations worldwide to build financial cooperation. From, um, uh, so I have, this, I have a theory based on the research that I've done so far, is that they were not contributing to financialization, but rather they were providing finance in the service of production and an expanded economic cooperation. These priorities, these were higher priorities from the archival documents that there were higher priorities given to expanded production and expanded economic cooperation as opposed to profit making. The bank was a socialist bank reflecting specifically Yugoslavia's worker self-management socialism. In 1974, the Yugoslav government took its worker self-management model to a new level. And I'm arguing that I'm presenting this as a, an improvement and a further development of socialism. But many people would actually say, such as Darko Suvin would argue that this is actually a, um, possibly the undermining of socialism. Um, so in 1974, they had a new constitution which had a new participatory forms of planning. Enterprises were broken up into smaller basic organizations of associated labor. They called these basic organizations of associated labor, labor bowls. These bowls were relatively small and were uh, supposed to be independent of each other and the firm they were part of. The bowls created their own plans, which were then integrated into a larger nationwide social plan. And then that made planning more participatory. The founders of the Yugoslav Bank were these bowls, these bowls which produced and exported goods. There were, these bowls were shipyard, um, they were shipyards that built cargo ships, there were construction firms, there were other producers, but there were also the members of the bank were exporters and commercial banks. These organizations signed the agreement on association that created the bank and, it cre and these associations provided all the funding for the bank. There was also funding that came from the National Bank as well. But um, this bank was basically, if we think of it as something like a cooperative among producers. 
Um, by the, the mid-1980s, there were over 200 members of the bank, which continued to contribute funds, and they also ran the various worker self-management committees. And so this bank was uh, in line with the ideas of worker self-management in the 1970s. Um, they had many ways that they tried to um, provide finance in the name of solidarity. Yugoslavia needed this solidarity because they were functioning in a very difficult situation. They had been for some time, but it got worse in 1980 because Tito passed away the same year that the bank opened. Um, internationally, also, the Yugoslav's main market was developing countries. And so, um, but the developing countries were entering into a humongous debt crisis. So they, the Yugoslav bank wanted to figure out a way, and the, all the, the Yugoslav bankers involved with this were trying to figure out ways to keep capital in the global south, or to create capital in the global south. And so they, did, they tried to do this with different kinds of projects, um, and they thought at one, one particular thing they really wanted to do is to um, fund uh, joint ventures, wholly owned companies, and jointly owned companies with a variety of uh, developing countries. Um, let me just, I can put this up here. Uh, so these are some of the joint ventures. You can see that there are a variety of countries here. We have the U.S. with 10 joint ventures, but we have USSR, and this is actually unusual here. Uh, but Algeria, uh, Egypt, and Ghana, and Ivory Coast. Um, with Ivory Coast, they had a, um, a joint venture, which was a bank that they created in Ivory Coast. So um, so there was a, they were trying to encourage... What's very obvious in the, in the bank records is they're trying to encourage long-term economic cooperation. We can sit there and say like, oh, they were just interested in selling their goods. But the thing is, is that we have to remember that Yugoslavia was, uh, had a great interest in working with others. This interest in working with others was to sell their goods, but also that they relied on these places all over the world. And if you think about it, if they, were, if they were in solidarity with other countries and just did things because it was nice or, or it was some sort of philanthropy, that wouldn't actually make them very powerfully invested in non-alignment. But non-alignment meant much more to them than that. So the policy was to encourage long-term economic cooperation. And they were looking for new ways to do this. So one example, and this is for people who know anything about these kinds of deals that they were making, this is an, a, a kind of typical one. In, the 19, in 1980, a Yugoslav a company called Vozila Gorica built a factory in Tanzania to, to assemble trailers, and, uh, trailers for trucks and trailers for agricultural equipment. The Yugoslav bank provided supplementary export financing and insurance to enable this long-term production cooperation. The Yugoslav firm transferred without payment all the technological rights and all the engineering and... Uh, trained all the Tanzanian personnel. The Tanzanian State Motor Company purchased the trailers from the factory each year, and the trail they sold the trailers to other parts of Africa. From the Yugoslav side, the factory was very successful, and was an, and they said in the notes that it was a very good example of cooperation between two non-aligned countries. And I believe that the factory existed at least until 1996. Um, but it may actually still be functioning, I don't know. So we know that this was a very long-term form of cooperation. However, in 1983, the Tanzanian government could only pay for the trailers in local currency, and they couldn't pay in Deutschmarks, which is what they were originally going to pay in. So the Yugoslav company couldn't repay the Yugoslav bank. So to resolve the problem, the Yugoslav bank accepted payment in kind through barter, in t uh, Tanzanian export commodities. So they were getting uh, cotton, zizel, hides, and coffee. Um, then to obtain hard currency, what the Yugoslav uh, companies would do is trade the hides with a Yugoslav leather company. And so there were all these sort of trades going on to move the goods through uh, the economy. The Yugoslav bank worked on a variety of experiments to keep trade and economic cooperation going. So we can see here, um, this is a long quote, but basically they're saying our traditional partners have found themselves in difficulties. Uh, Jubmes is the name of the banks uh, in Serbo-Croatian. Serbo um, so the difficulties, Al Egypt, Algeria, Liberia, Iraq, Gabon, Libya, and Venezuela are having a lot of trouble um, in paying back their, paying back the debts. 
And so they're looking at these are just a bunch of different ways that they think, well, maybe we can do these things. But they say it is necessary that a policy of repayment of claims be based on decisions which will contribute to the development of further cooperation of these two countries. I'd actually not these two countries, but these, these two the individual with the Yugoslavia, Yugoslav countries. So there's this interest in maintaining these long-term relationships. They also did things uh, with, uh, they uh, had zero interest loans, they had long payment periods and different, uh, different kinds of ways to make these uh, things, uh, the trading relationships continue. As a result of the work of the Yugoslav Bank and other financial institutions, the Yugoslav economy functioned within what can be seen as an attempt to create a more global economy. Um, uh, James Mark at Exeter has uh, said that East European countries were much better at bilateral globalization, using building many bilateral relationships that creates a global world and, uh, by overlapping bi bilateralisms. This might be the case here. Um, if we see, um, and the, for example, this is just the insurance that they were providing for exports. We have 48 countries uh, that the bank is doing. These are some of the relationships with the, around the world. We can see that this is very much expanded from the original, or what Yugoslavia would have started with their trading partners in the 1950s. We see an expansion to quite a wide range. And even when in 1989, we have a much reduced um, number of countries because of the debt crisis, but this is 1989. What I found interesting in the archives too is, is that the things that they're exporting are quite unusual. To me, that was unexpected. In 1989, they're, they're exporting very uh, huge cargo ships, a lot of uh, heavy industry is be heavy uh, industry items are being uh, sold abroad, and of course they're doing a lot of military exports as well. Um, so they, it, I was kind of impressed by that. Okay, so along with uh, other socialist and non-aligned banks, the Yugoslav Bank was an innovator and a generator of the field of global banking. And I haven't been able to show that much here, but these I have an idea that uh, socialist banks are much more global banks. The banks, like we think of Lloyd's of London, are actually neocolonial banks. They don't have the same kind of attempts at a global reach. And these are uh, banks that are trying to finance in the service of production, export, and solidarity, rather than in profit and speculation. The Yugoslav Bank also reflected worker self-management socialism that the Yugoslav government was interested in. Okay, so I've argued, maybe who knows, or rather per per persuasively, that only socialists work to realize a financial, financial globalization that might connect all worlds, all worlds, all countries in mutual and equal relationships. They did so in the face of obstacles created by capitalist countries and against claims that laissez-faire would allow for a flat, connected world to emerge. We should recognize that socialist and non-aligned countries were developing financial and economic systems with m markets, money, prices, and banks that prioritize production, export, and solidarity. And the Yugoslavs also prioritized economic democracy. This emerging world economy had politics and battles among the countries that had very different economic interests. The neoclassical economic model of a potential socialist future motivated economists to create institutions like the Yugoslav Bank for International Economic Cooperation, which would hopefully enable uh, participation and solidarity of all countries in a truly global economy. In 1990s, however, these institutions for financial cooperation were destroyed and financialization dominated, which I leave to Fabio to discuss. Thank you. Are you going to use this? The no, I'm not. Okay. So, um, thank you for being here. This is a much nicer lounge that we had in anthropology, so I feel a little jealous. Um, anyways, so in 2010, the uh, Prime Minister of Macedonia at the time, um, Nikola Gorevsky, and also President of the Vomorodo Pomona Conservative, a neo-liberal uh, as well as Christian and then authoritarian party, um, launched a urban redevelopment plan. The plan was called Skopje 2014, um, and it consisted in over 137 objects, including a six multi-level uh, neo-baroque parking lots, uh, a triumphal arch, a copy of the London Wheel Ferry Eye thingy, um, and over 80 statues and sculptures. Uh, the project uh, was supposed to propel Macedonia into Europe uh, to provide a new national identity, 
um, and was financed by loans, essentially raised on international markets by the government. It costed about 683 uh, million euro, which at the time was not disclosed, right? At the time they said it was, oh, no, it's going to be about 100, 150 million. Uh, so under the Gresk authoritarian regime, Macedonia increased its debt from about 1.8 billion euro, which in 2006 was about 20% of GDP, to 4.8 billion euros, which in uh, 2016 was about uh, 46% of GDP. So massive increase in debt. Now, there is a tendency among urban theorists to see this kind of investments in urban spaces as a logical extension of the contradictions of capital. And here, you know, we have some people who have theorized that. So, you know, David, in his seminal work on capital fixes, thinks about crisis of us overaccumulation, how they move from one space of production to the next, and then to real estate, and eventually also to kind of immaterial elements that can be, or things that can be exchanged, such as uh, financial products. Now, Albers has expanded his idea, thinking about financialization as a movement of walls of money that need to be placed somewhere in order to generate profit. And, and that's great and explains a lot of things uh, from you know, the center, the core of capitalist systems. But in places like Macedonia, you know, which are at the periphery of the periphery, if you want, uh, not only financialization happened to a certain extent through Yugoslav past, and as we have just heard, the Yugoslav form of finance was not exactly the same kind of finance. So it did not operate along the same kind of logics of profit. But also, you know, after the destruction of socialism and the socialist economy, you had a period in which foreign investments were not coming in. So Macedonian companies would be would have been very happy to be bought by fiat and exploited, you know, brutally in the 90s, but that simply didn't happen for a while. So that kind of um, development of financialization in a hostile environment, to paraphrase Arrighi, needs to be explained uh, looking at the specific social formation that take place in that kind of environment. So today I'm going to try to look at some of the social formation by looking at the nexus between um, foreign or companies that worked and operated outside of Yugoslavia, import-export companies mostly, um, and, and security apparatuses and how they kind of managed to generate a specific kind of uh, financial transactions that empowered oligarchs and how that kind of became important in the authoritarian, for the authoritarian government. Now, the reason, so if we had two days to discuss this, first I would go into the kind of uh, global financial dynamics that allowed for this accumulation of debt and then translating into, uh, into the city products. And so I would look into investments and, you know, Italian, especially business owners who came into Macedonia in 2013 when I did my field work. Um, and then I would leave into uh, the past, this kind of accumulation of, of capital uh, that historically have that in, in Yugoslavia. But uh, I will leave the first part outside of the scope of this uh, intervention and uh, I will just focus on the second part. So we'll look at some of these historical uh, dynamics. Now the reason why I want to do that is theoretically, theoretical as well as political. And we have a tendency today to think about um, conspiratory politics, right? The, the 1%, the global capitalists, or, you know, the authoritarian leaders who own everything and very little can be done about that. And this is certainly a kind of conservative agenda that has been pushed, in Macedonia at least, to justify inaction, right? So if we look at some of the reasons why capital was accumulated, some of the pathways in which specifically capital was accumulated or, or used, then we can look at some of the elements where maybe progressive policies can be pushed through. Um, okay, so when I asked a former manager of an import-export company why or where was the capital for the authoritarian government coming from, from the Vimero party, he pointed at a long-standing genealogy centered around Jordan Mialkov, who, uh, the father of Sasha Mialkov, um, who was the chief of Macedonian intelligence between 2006 and 2016. So Mialkov Sr. worked as a representative for one of Macedonia's biggest uh, um, textile companies, Makotex, in the Czech Republic, in Prague. In socialist Yugoslavia, few figures achieved the same degree of mysticism uh, than directors involved in international trades. Those could be general directors, uh, financial directors, or simply representatives for Macedonian and Yugoslav companies outside of the country. So people like Mialko found buyers for Yugoslav exports, which you know, was not the only reason for cooperation, but certainly important, and mediated between different worlds. The world of socialist economy, the world of capitalist economy, and the world of non-aligned economy. 
Now, the job of convincing foreign partners to buy Yugoslav products was made particularly difficult by the inconsistent quality and sometimes excessive price of Yugoslav and especially Macedonian exports. Uh, in the case of Macedonia, we're talking typically about heavy industry and maybe some of these cargo ships were produced in Macedonia, although being a Latin lock country, and then a lot of agricultural products. So, for example, in 1956, a report from the um, Secretariat for Commerce laments that it costed about $30 per ton to transport products from Skopje to the Yugoslav border. Um, but, and then I'm quoting, from the Yugoslav border or port to the farthermost unloading port abroad, be it in New York, Italy, Ceylon, Beirut, it costs no more than $20, $25 per ton. So it costs more from here to there, to push, you know, to other places, then from there to New York, which is paradoxical. Uh, meanwhile, you know, things could be spoiled by the old socialist infrastructures, train wagons were not adapted to transport tomatoes and, and pepper, peppers, which were some of the most important exports of Macedonia. Um, so most of the advanced industry in Yugoslavia were located close to the border with Western Europe. So Bosnia, Kosovo, South of Serbia, Macedonia had mining, heavy industry, and energy production. Most of the Yugoslav investments in Macedonia were realized in the end of the 70s or 80s and consisted in, uh, you know, things like uh, a nickel plant or, or a Jelizara so a, a place to produce actually um, iron and other kind of products like that. Um, but at the time when the global economy favored light industry. And so, you know, kind of out of sync with the global economy, Macedonian exports lagged in quantity and quality and were not supported by a strong commercial network of expert cadres. So in 1975, the Socialist Currency Inspectorate, SDI, of Skopje reported significant problems with receiving payments of goods that they were exporting because they simply were not up to standards and so other firms abroad simply did not want to pay. These exports, however, were crucial to improve the trade balance of Yugoslavia and Socialist Macedonia and fix the country's illiquidity problems. In 1971, a report again from the Secretariat of Finance of Macedonia highlights a higher volume of domestic purchases compared to that of sales. So buying more than what they sold, companies relied on credit to function, rather than being financially independent. This put incredible stress on banks. As the report states, the level of liquidity in banks within the Social Republic of Macedonia is raising preoccupation. In the first three months of 1971, each of the two major commercial banks had insufficient cash for up to five days per month. So they could not pay, they could not uh, give out money either for payments between companies or to workers. Two reasons contributed to liquidity in the banking sector. First, large chunks of capital were tied up in long-term projects, such as the reconstruction of Skopje after a devastating earthquake that had taken place in 1963. But second, Macedonian companies faced systemic challenges to generate profits and pay back loans. Uh, even if they were exporting, archival data shows that, show that the Macedonian economy generated significant losses since the 1950s. In 1965, reports indicated unbalanced losses of Macedonian companies affected viable companies who were forced to wait before receiving their payments or, or use exchange bills. In 1971, 47 companies worked with cash flow problems. The biggest Macedonian company, the Gilezara Skopje, which produced, again, this kind of big uh, iron structures and boats paid its 6,300 workers with a delay of five days because of its unpaid obligation for suppliers, but especially because its claims were in excess of 300 million dinners were not being paid for a long time. Other firms' workers were paid with delays of 14 to 30 days. So I won't go into details there, but um, despite long-standing and, and widely sh um, propagated ideas that Yugoslav companies or socialist companies had soft budget, which was to a certain extent true, they could actually bankrupt. And so um, documents I obtained from various Macedonian inspectors show that for socialist organs of control, the Yugoslav society needed to become a Slobodan Paza, so a free economy, a free market economy, um, regulated by economic coercion. These are the words of what would be the first president of, of independent Macedonia, Kiro Gligorov, which at the time was an important um, economist. Uh, in 1965, the Social Accounting Office, which was the agency that managed payments between banks as well as to uh, all sorts of other uh, individuals, conducted 22,000 forced payments ordered by courts. 
uh, against companies who were insolvent or were not paying their workers, for example. So according to Susan Woodward, uh, Yugoslavia's chronic illiquidity was a function of the Yugoslavian leadership misunderstanding or particular understanding of their position within the global economic system. Tito non-aligned strategy and break with Russia forced him to rely upon economic aid and, and generate all sorts of interdependency relations, um, which, however, turned badly at a certain point in time. So in 1952, the country's debt amounted to $180 million, 20 million of which were used to purchase basic food supplies. So the country literally relied on credit to survive. Um, gradually, the Yugoslav leadership aimed at becoming economic independently by enforcing economic responsibility and substitute IMF and other international organizations' assistance with their own homegrown development, which unfortunately never quite caught up to speed. Uh, Yugoslav companies continued to rely upon import, uh, especially in the area of technologies, and by the early 1980s, 99.6% of imports were crucial to Yugoslav production. So without those, exp those, those imports, there simply would have been no production. These are figures that Woodward take from a conversation with Yugoslav economists at the time, um, and I take from her. As the trade, trade account of the country remained in deficit between 1952 and 1983, except for 1965, the country kept on borrowing from external lenders. As early as 1961, Yugoslavia needed to refinance its hard currency denominated debt. The structural condition de facto assigned systemic importance to import-export firms, forcing the leadership to essentially um, devolve and gradually devolve increasing control over the uh, hard currency supply in order to sustain the confidence of foreign lenders. So we see that because of the structural problems and the reliance of debt of the Yugoslav economies, import-export companies become crucial. They have access to foreign denominated currency and they're particularly systemically relevant to maintain the country afloat. Now, in fact, this became a political issue. In 1971, Croatian students at the University of Zagreb staged a strike that expanded quickly and ignited the, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, Tito notoriously uh, crashed the protest with riot police, um, but the motivation that had started it, among other kind of nationalist concern, was the allocation of hard currency. In fact, Yugoslavia generated half of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, sorry, Croatia generated half of the Yugoslav uh, inflow of foreign currency through mainly tourism, yet only 10% of those earnings remain in, Yugos in Croatia. All the others were converted into dinners and then um, stored essentially in the national bank system. Now, in 1972, uh, despite crushing the protest, the amount of foreign currency that export companies could retain without converting in dinners was raised to 20% and 45% in the case of um, um, tourist companies. So import expert managers like Mialkov Sr. Um, found creative uses for their enlarged control over accounts in international hard currencies. Between 1970 and 1973, companies like Makotex sold Macedonian products, and specifically textile products, to their own branches in Germany, Austria, and Italy, thus leading to the disappearance of large sum sums of foreign denominated currency. Others, like Agro Macedonia, reported larger unpaid contracts, or at least sums of foreign currency that were not brought into the country, according to the SDI. Agro Macedonia had 20 international debtors, including its own branches in Belgium. While the SDI does not explain why there were this kind of plays with foreign currency uh, in details, documents suggest that the managers of Agro Macedonia were particularly creative in that respect. So half of the commission they earned as representative for German company Frisch, I don't know what they were selling, uh, so 500,000 Deutschmarks, was redistributed to the branches abroad apparently to keep them afloat. Uh, but Agro Macedonia Sofia, you know, what's up with these Bulgarians, uh, utilized a nexus to increase the prices of goods and pocketed the difference without letting the, um, the Yugoslav organs of control uh, know. So there were other methods to play around with these um, currency limitations. Some companies would import products from the Eastern Bloc, re-export them to their branches in Western countries, and then sell them in Yugoslavia for hard currency. Instead of Klirinsky dollari, a kind of currency of account uh, or county currency used for intra-Soviet uh, kind of clearing arrangements. 
Others did the opposite, so they declare their imports as originating from Western countries to access subventions for imports, and then they actually bought from the East via clearing agreements. Um, false bills where products were paid but not imported or exported but unpaid were also rather common in the archives. So from the perspective of Inspector in Skopje, the manipulation of foreign currency um, damaged the Yugoslav economy and meant that Yugoslav firms were actually providing credit to foreign companies. Um, but for managers of import-export companies, uh, the question was in different terms. According to them, disappearing foreign currency would generate profits through black market sales that help balance the accounts of import-export companies, but also of other struggling companies. In fact, you know, restrictions limited the amount of imports to a percentage of exports. So companies were incentivized to export even if it was a loss, so they could actually buy imports needed for production. So according to them, this playing with currencies was, ne was necessary to keep production afloat. Now, as a manager within this import-export network, uh, my, mm, Mialkov Sr. gained considerable political and economic capital. Now, we don't know the whole details, but after his stint as director of Makotex Prague Bureau, Mialkov Sr. was appointed as Minister of the Interior in the first independent government of Macedonia, where he rejoined old family friends such as Prime Minister Nikola Kyusev or Minister of Justice Georgi Naumu. While the Shtipska Vrska, so this, this connection through their hometown of Shtip, is certainly important, it is rather bizarre that a crucial role in the new government, in charge of dealing with powerful security structures such as the Yugoslav intelligence community, was given to a civilian with no exper expertise in police activity, who was a foreign representative in Prague. So why him? Many suggest that there is more to Mialkov than what hits the high, including connection to Udba and Kos, the powerful security services of Yugoslavia. Sources from the former Yugoslav intelligence community I interviewed confirmed those rumors. While Udba and Kos did not control directly import-export company per se, um, Yugoslav security services kept a close, eyes on the, close eye on them and their directors. According to my sources, Mialkov was a small fish who sold currency in the black market under their protection. So why did Yugoslav security services tolerated or protected such schemes with foreign currencies? Authors who worked on Bulgaria, again, those Bulgarians, um, suggest that security services from the socialist time were directly involved in running import-export companies, organizing illicit sale of cigarettes, alcohol, and drugs because they needed hard currencies. Yugoslavia, however, did not need to resort to such kind of covert operation. They could very well trade with the West, and so they did not need to organize informal networks. However, yearly reports of the SDI consulted mention that Yugoslav import-export companies possessed unnamed Cerne Fondovi, so black funds. Uh, there is a lot of speculation about what those Cerne funds, or Cern, uh, black funds were. But former directors suggested those funds were constituted by a small amount of gold and foreign currencies available for discretionary purchases. The SDI believed that those funds were the result of embezzlement or frauds operated by rogue directors. Uh, intelligence officers, however, told me that many of those black funds were utilized by them, by the Yugoslav security services. Um, and so unaccounted and traceable stashes of cash, as well as accounts in German, Swiss, or other Western or Eastern European banks under the name of Yugoslav firms were actually necessary to conduct covert operations. So there is much more to analyze and much more to this story. But it is interesting here that somebody who was located as one of the import-export, manager of an import-export companies, manages to become um, the first minister of the interior in Yugoslavia through connections that led him to manipulate currency, the same connections that Yugoslav Secret Services utilized for whom he was linked, uh, an informator, an informant, we don't know exactly the specific details. Um, and then his son becomes the head of the security services in the newly independent Macedonia under the Gurevsky regime. Right. There seems to be a line there, a very interesting one. Um, 
But let me conclude here for now uh, by suggesting that these socialist networks of experts in the manipulation of foreign currency evolved organically after the transition. So struck by Yugoslav war's embargoes against its more imposed, important trade partners, that is Serbia, and then paralyzed by a Greek embargo, independent Macedonia pivoted towards a great market economy in the early 1990s. Having access to smuggling routes as well as being positioned for reaching international markets, businessmen and former intelligence operatives constituted the background that allowed many oligarchs to rise. Now, the interesting thing is that those early oligarchs were not connected to the Vemorodo Pomona and Gurevsky party. They were actually former socialist cadre, mostly. So Mialkov Sr. and his Vemorodo Pomona comrades will have to wait until 1998 to benefit from those connections. In fact, a few months into his job, Mialkov Sr. Um, died in a suspicious car accident on his route to Belgrade. Two years later, um, the Vemorodo Pomona was defeated at the election, allowing Kiro Gligorov, the very famous economist um, and other uh, member of the communist nomenclatura, to gain power and oversee the um, kind of emergence of local oligarchs, the, the privatization process, and the kind of share of spoils of the socialist regime. Now, in 1998, when the Vemorodo Pomona, Mialkov, and his cousin Nikola Gurevsky took power again, they started managing some shady privatization, but also, and most crucially, to revamp their connection to the security services. They collected information about, compromising information about oligarchs. And then in 2006, when they uh, again gained power after being defeated, um, they capitalized about, on these connections and um, started centralizing the network of uh, Yugoslav era import, export, as well as currency manipulators. Together with this kind of uh, apparatus that they quickly solidified around the figure of Sasha Mialkov, um, Gurevsky and um, the Vermont regime utilized international finance, real estate projects such as COP 2014 as the proverbial carrot. To make sure and to be able to buy the regime some degree of coercion as well as collaboration from the oligarchs who had amassed incredible amount of wealth through those connections in the early part of the privatization. And so essentially what I think is interesting here is that this connection, this kind of, this terroir, if you want, of businessmen connected to security services um, empowered the former socialist elite and in order to kind of defeat that alliance, if you want, and to tap back into it, uh, that's the moment where international finance came back into play, allowing the Vemorod de uh, government to solidify an authoritarian regime. Thanks. this a conversation. <laughs> so I think we can open up for, um, it doesn't have to just be questions. I think we should open it up this is a conversation. Yeah, I'd love to pick up from you, because otherwise <laughs> sure, I forget this, and this, this is very rich altogether. Um, and it shows again why it is so super interesting to deal with, with Yugoslavia, post Yugoslavia, and Eastern Europe, and also take their economics more seriously. Um, but there is, of course, a difference in the approach between the two of you, which is very interesting. You take the economists much more seriously than Fabio does. Mm -hmm. And Fabio sees all these, these different circuits, these overlapping circuits, and all these actors at the lower level uh, in practice, you know, working with and against each other. And, and it creates a very dynamic structure. But I, I would love to pick up on the issue, yes. So, Joanna, you see, you, you take the economists' claim, the Yugoslav economists' claim seriously that they are building a different globalization within the non aligned movement. I, I would love to subscribe to that. <laughs> um, but then they want German marks. Mm -hmm. That is not for nothing, because Yugoslav's own trade balance is largely with Germany. And as Fabio says, 
uh, they are continuously here in that with the Germans. And then from, from the 1960s, 60s onwards, they have now proportionally one of the largest state dots to the IMF um, in Eastern Europe. So they are continuously going out of breath. And at the same so that's one thing. They are continuously out of breath. They need hard currency. So to what extent is this idea of non-aligned real globalization in terms of technology transfer and all those things that capitalist globalization does not do, is it actually functional to paying off their own debts to Germany and the IMF continuously? And then the second one is, within Yugoslavia, um, the Yugoslav socialist economy always failed to create even conditions. Um, it remained a super uneven landscape of development. And now, as Fabio also highlights, uh, Macedonia, is, and, and that's true for you know, much, much outside of Serbia and Slovenia and parts of Croatia, it's about either tourism or, uh, or commodity uh, production uh, or extraction, which is a classic north-south divide, as we know. So even within Yugoslavia, they never solved those divisions of labor. Um, and so the question that I get from there is, to what extent does real socialist globalization within the non-aligned movement actually reproduce similar capitalist forms of division of labor? So two questions in fact. So one of the things I think is important about this about the um, the aspect of what they're trying to do is that um, we often focus on the debt of the second and third world to the first world, but we know first of all that the United States is one of the biggest debtors to the world, much more than the whole world. It, it owes much more money. But more interestingly, is that the um, every single debtor country is a creditor country. Uh, that they are doing, they are providing at the least some kind of export credits to deal with their export businesses. So, um, the so the largest third world debtors to Yugoslavia were Liberia, Algeria, and Peru. Liberia owed a, a, almost five hundred million dollars to Yugoslavia. So, the, so that these uh, debts uh, reflect an, ex, an attempted expansion of globalization that is often ignored because the, the data we have is OECD, uh, OECD data, and that data is the members are not the third world countries, so we don't actually capture them. The thing that's also very important about this, and I think it's the most important part about the debt crisis, is, is that the US and Europe could force repayment, whereas the countries that owe, for example, Yugoslavia or the Soviet Union are still re being repaid right now. So that we we have we have Russia just finished off some payments recently uh, got received some payments recently so like uh, these payments are still going on so and I don't understand why this isn't a bigger problem that people that these are these have been decades and decades of non-payment so um, and the thing is is about this argument I'm making in some sense is that. Um, is that this globalization and this attempt. This was an attempt to do this. This was moving in this direction and then was undermined. And I think maybe there's, maybe there's, I don't really do the uh, internal dynamics, but there was an attempt to create, head towards equality. I mean, that was seriously undermined, but it was an attempt was made to do this. And if you didn't have the ideology, you might not have ever tried, right? And many countries don't try to, to resolve inequalities. But I don't know, what do you think about the, I mean, you, you could see in the documents that I at least looked at that there was an attempt to invest and to promote certain kind of development. Messina received an incredible amount of money from Yugoslavia. It just wasn't the right kind of investment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you build a factory that produces a ship in the in one of the only places that is landlocked in the entire of Yugoslavia, right? I mean, there were some of these kinds of issues that were circulating. Where, so, but, but definitely the money came to the very reconstruction of Skopje was was an attempt to show solidarity internally as well as internally, right? It was a city completely reconstructed through grants and money and investments. There was a big fund to fund right. the underdeveloped parts of Yugoslavia. So massive right. amounts of money from the 
it's also a fact that they had very little time. I mean, they, they, they basically got into their post-war period by the mid-1960s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, after reconstruction yeah. and after yeah. building up again. And then 15 years later, it's already starting to collapse. So, so in that sense, I excuse them too, that, that their alternative vision of, uh, of global development didn't have time to work. But, but I also want to remain skeptical. Um, that is also because of, you know, the very fact that Yugoslavia itself remains so incredibly dependent upon um, the labor export, the export of labor to, to Germany. And so much of their internal uh, finances was dependent on, on the remittances that came from the German autobahn. So it, it remains such an unbalanced and from the very beginning, uh, yeah, you know, colonial situation in many ways. Um, it remains very, very fascinating to see how they sort of try to swim against that tide. Also, how they try to work towards after after eighty nine towards creating this this uh, this larger Balkan uh, sphere of trade, for example, which is completely consistent with what they had been trying to do in the normal line movement. So a lot of chapeau, I should say, but, but there are so many unevennesses from the beginning and contradictions from the beginning that it can never solve. Mm -hmm. Well, and one other thing about this, about the um, the people working in, in Germany, in West Germany, is that also they were simultaneously um, exports and uh, you know, ex experts and, um, and working people being sent around, thousands and thousands of people working abroad elsewhere. So the UN organized um, the exchange of experts, and so many people were working. And then, of course, their companies were working abroad. The construction companies had huge projects around the world. So there was, um, there were. Uh, it wasn't just a West Germany, or just you know that they were they were moving people around quite a bit. And I think they were attempting, like again, attempting to do more of that is what they would wish to do. One of the other interesting things was that when you talk to managers of Yugoslav companies, they seemed to be convinced that they were doing, uh, you know, fantastic work. That Yugoslavia had all these industries, and all these products, and it's true. I mean, they definitely did access to a lot of things. They produced very interesting products, etc. But when you look at the archival records, it sounds like Yugoslavia was always, to a certain extent, a peripheral country. And, and tried very much to move in a different direction, but just like many other peripheral countries in you know throughout the world, they were trying to substitute you know import substitution schemes or, or internal development. They simply couldn't do it, right? So that to a certain extent, that kind of level of development that they talk about, we were going outside of the country, helping build I don't know airstrips in Algeria, you know, Bolnitsi somewhere else, and so on and so forth was was actually, you know, functional to produce a certain image of Yugoslavia, which I don't know how long or how much would have stood up over time. So, so that kind of peripheralization that we see today is reflecting a much longer trajectory of peripheral relations that, that were there and never really quite solved at the global level. Do you know how the Yugoslav activities compare to those of the Comic-Con countries in terms of its projects abroad? Because I just I have only the most vague anecdotal evidence that probably more Bulgarians were going abroad to places in. So can, can you can you repeat that? I think that that I think some people from some of the Comic Con countries were working abroad in large numbers. For example, Bulgarians, large numbers of Bulgarians working in Libya. I have the I get the feeling those they probably had bigger projects like this than Yugoslavia. I don't think they had bigger projects. I think because there were quite um, the the construction companies in Yugoslavia are quite like, substantial. They were doing large, um, I mean, all sorts of uh, complex, like uh, like I mean, they did like hotel complexes and and various um, you know airports and big you know, housing blocks and stuff. So I don't have any real daily data on the not the comparative ones, it's a good but question, though. but it, they were you know for the Yugoslav at least the markets in Iraq, Libya. In other countries that especially could provide oil were particularly important so there was competition between common cons country yeah. within Yugoslavia itself um, and they were very aggressive in trying to get them I don't know how you would compare them
Yeah, it would be very interesting to, to actually expand uh, the view here, because we always talk about Eastern Europe, but of course, Yugoslavia was the only non-aligned country in Central and Eastern Europe, and it would be very interesting to compare the Yugoslav efforts at, at their own globalization, and their own, let's say, financial system as a niche within the global financial system, for example, with Iran, which is, I think, the only nation that, that ultimately has been really successful in the technology transfer and, and taking control over Western technologies within the non life movement. Yugoslavia was doing that, was trying to do that, but, but then was cut short. But Iran actually got to the, you know, to the nuclear fusion. Um, so yeah, it would be very interesting, I think, to create larger comparisons. Yes, that's a good point. I mean, also because the, the Yugoslavs were also working um, through, they were much more active in the UN. I mean, there were people working, there was, a, there was in the OCTAD, there was an office for a socialist country which was active, but the Yugoslavs were active at all levels in the OCTAD and they were incredibly committed to the OCTAD project and other places within, the, um, and so that they were, they were trying, oh, the thing that's really important about this particular attempt by the non aligned movement is that they were trying to move beyond bilateral attempts to solve problems to multilateral attempts, just changing fundamentally the rules of the game is what they were trying to do in this way. And so Yugoslavia was, I think, had a, a rather different role because it was, it was much more independent in the, in the OCTAD than other countries were. You just raised the specter of bankruptcies and the possibility yeah. that there were, could be bankruptcies contrary to the salt budget. I just wonder, what is, do you have any idea about the incidence of bankruptcies or? Not on a statistical flows? scale. Um, the data I found from various moments show some negotiations around them. So in 1952, I believe, uh, there was a number of, of um, zadrugi, so, so uh, farms essentially, that, that were insolvent. And most of the Macedonian farms had problems uh, throughout documents that I found. But anyways, in that specific case, there was also individual farmers who had specific debts, and they were going to uh, close them, and then eventually they realized that it would be politically unsavvy, with this word, essentially. So for political reasons, they decided to actually provide them additional credit. Uh, a, construction, a couple of construction companies in the same period instead were closed down, were liquidated by decision, uh, because they were unprofitable. And that's something that most of the uh, Yugoslav managers told me. They said, well, you know, there are rules, there is there's a court, so if people don't pay you, you try not to go there, but eventually you can do that, and typically that somehow works out. Again, you can see different degrees of negotiations here. Uh, some, some companies would be much more successful to operating at the level of, of, of on the margins of profitability. Uh, by essentially engaging this kind of intra-company debt. And so I had some figures which I, I didn't bring with me um, of the level of intra-company debt, which was very significant in the 70s already. And that kind of exponentially you know, increased. But there were definitely many cases where companies were kept alive because of their strategic importance uh, and many other cases in which the, the importance was simply not there, so the Yugoslav leadership would allow them to bankrupt, or would actually force them to, to you know, bankrupt, and then move the, uh, the kind of property or the resources to some other company on the side. So Fanny, the one that was invested in Nikol Plant, was always extremely unproductive and, and never worked out in any, from any perspective, but they kept on insisting on it until the very end. Um, others, were, that I know of were just allowed, especially if they were smaller companies, they didn't have a systemic function, they were simply uh, let go. But that wouldn't be much different compared to other, you know, Western European companies who, you know, if you think about Italy, you have many cases of systemically important companies who were not productive for a long time and, you know, we kept them afloat in many ways. So it's, it didn't sound like the kind of soft budget constraints that are described by Cormai or others. It itself would create greater incentive for them if there was a threat of bankruptcy. Ultimately, it's some, even if it wasn't actualized in all cases, would definitely be um, an incentive for more of the kinds of 
roundabout right. ways to sustain themselves than it would be in other parts of Eastern Europe where the Absolutely. police were not going to yep. be closed down regardless of what they managed to do. Yep. Yeah, and it's particularly interesting, I think, in this case that uh, foreign currency was the uh, element that everyone was trying to get at. You know, the, the, the banks wanted it because systemically it was important to sustain that to, to restore investors' confidence at the level of Yugoslavia. Companies wanted it because it allowed them to buy then imports uh, from abroad. And then citizens wanted it because it allowed them to then buy, you know, all sorts of consumer goods, especially if they travel to, to Trieste or other places like that. So it became particularly <coughs> important people who were able to access the and play around those specific items, right? Foreign currency became a, a coveted good, coveted uh, consumer good almost. So, and then these people were able to generate and capitalize extensively on their connections later on with security services. Now, which shows again that that is sort of working to understand rise and internal transformations and then the decline and collapse of Yugoslavia as part of the rise and the collapse of the non-aligned movement too. Right. Yeah. Uh, because it was such an important, uh, what is it, uh, single unit in, in the chain that connected the non-aligned movement to the West and, and to the Soviet Union at the same time, no? I mean, the, the whole monoline basically starts to collapse from the late 1970s onwards. It's exactly the same moment that the, the Yugoslavia starts to collapse. Right. Because Yugoslavia is losing its export markets, it's, it's losing the places where it can send its, its experts to. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I think it's also important, too, to think about how this, at this moment, all these countries are trying to um, develop industries and they're yeah. all in, in comp competing with each other yeah. and so this is a very unfortunate thing that they think the Yugoslavs and others wish there was another way to go about it that would be more organized in some way and that's the World Bank made it worse because the World Bank would never let them organize at all and so there was this uh, huge amount of competition but also what's interesting too that someone was talking about recently um, that um, that these some of these uh, some of the technologies that were, like let's say there were computers and things that were sold at Bulgaria, sold computers and, and other groups, other countries, and they often would, they were, it was at least told during a talk I heard recently, that some of these um, items that were sold to companies were sold as a, um, a less developed version. They said they wanted to have a less developed version because they wanted to have more, more labor intensive versions so they could have more employment, because that was the key interest here. Isn't that interesting? So, yeah, they needed it less, less savvy, or less um, developed. I understood there are some worker cooperatives now forming in Yugoslavia. Of late? Ooh. Yes, yes, that's correct. Is that, is worker uh, cooperatives? Yeah. I'm glad to that's already over, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what, and what, what are they? What are they uh, I'm not sure in what area, but it may be unique. I know about the big one in Croatia, which is a machine shop, mm -hmm. a printing shop, also in Croatia. Then there's a lot of contestation around uh, the, the, the privatization of, of factories in, uh, in northern Serbia, um, where the cooperative option is always somehow on the table. Right. Yeah, but so there's a lot, there's quite a lot of pressure in that direction. But it seems to me they are intellectually very under supported. I mean, the, 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 all of the university systems have been, and, and the labor unions have been entirely sucked into uh, neoliberal economics, and it's, there's, there's very little intellectual support for that. But, yeah. There have been some people, though, in the area um, at in 1989 that were trying to support uh, cooperative moves. That uh, was David Ellerman. He was a uh, yeah. So he was very. He was. He and his colleagues at the Ohio, the ESOPs that he was involved with too. Ownership. Yeah, they were all trying to influence, especially people in uh, Slovenia, to, to go with this. And then they were also trying to work in the Soviet Union to support this. Some early, but I don't know what happened to those groups after that. Yeah, in my work, I've shown that in, in Poland, for example, you had also a very strong uh, corporate in, in eighty-nine till ninety-one. That, that concerned hundreds of businesses. There was a 
lot of bottom support for that, quite a big part. Quickly killed off by uh, uh, yeah, by, by privatization, basically. But, but also, but the thing is, is that privatization as a word meant many things to yes. many people, and workers could think like, oh, yeah. the privatization means that we yeah. own it as a cooperative, right? Yeah. Like they could perceive yeah. it that way, right? Yeah. yeah. That's and the unions haven't been very supportive either. Yeah. Right. Of the cooperative movement? Well, Poland they were very supportive of that for, mm -hmm. for quite a while. Uh, yeah, but they, they basically lost the legal fight in the early 1990s, and then many of these cooperative, well, yeah, cooperative units in many ways, uh, or potentially cooperative units, got indebted to the central bank because of, uh, because of the transition shock. Um, and then the central bank started at, at one moment in time immediately to call in the debts. And, and that's the moment where, where the cooperative option basically just disappeared. Cooperatives have always had trouble getting loans because yeah. they're, they're, they don't have a, a central manager who could ask for loans. They always look strange when 14 people come up to a bank and say, you want a loan. Yeah. Yeah. Banks aren't used to being approached by 13 people. Yeah. But they, they, for them it was quite easy in Poland in any case. So uh -huh. That's the story that I know really well. It's, it was very easy to get loans in the beginning of right. the 90s because they were still official uh, socialist enterprises. Right. But they were developing in a clique cooperative direction. There was a lot of force in that direction. And so they got in debt. But then at once the central bank started to pull in the loans and it sort of killed them all off. It's also the, the case too of the influence of Jeffrey Sachs who was yeah. very anti-worker control right. and he was against this. And I mean, for in the Pol I don't know about the Polish case, but the Yugoslav case, it was just a slap in the face. It's like, wait, you're going to actually centralize the ownership of these companies and then privatize them to someone else. When we've already privatized it to the workers. So what is the, you know, like, that's, this is a, just a, a, just a fraud, basically. Yeah. Well, one of the, the historical origins of the rise of the right in Poland is precisely that state started to reaccumulate socialist property under its own property claims from the workers. Yeah. So the, the workers in the early 90s got very much anti-state, and the state was now being run by the former intelligentsia that was used to be aligned to them, um, the Solidarność intellectuals. And so that is where the, where, the, where, the, where the rupture was created and where the strong Polish right was formed. Because they were criticizing, because they were angry that the state reappropriated exactly. the firm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But Pierre, in special period Cuba, the state invested quite a bit in cooperatives, is that right? Yeah. So more so than before. Oh yeah. I mean, cooperatives in Cuba are, you know, in an efficiency context. They're, they're sort of being developed by the state to enhance the private sector, to create efficiency because the workers in the state sector were lagging behind. Raul has criticized the state workers as being a drag on the economy. So what's the relationship to the two kinds of currency then? Well, they're not going to mess with that for quite a while because the, the, the coup and the coup are, are a real problem. I mean, so many people living off the coup, that's the, you know, the subsidized coupon. So cooperatives also run off the coup? They yes. Okay. They don't directly trade for our currency. Yeah, there's a real problem there. The, um, the um, so much of the tourism now because of uh, Trump's thing uh, is going into bed and breakfasts that do live off the cook. So there's a secondary economy that's yeah, exploding. of course, that's really disparate now. Yeah. yeah. Very dangerous situation. But, but are you not afraid that the cooperatives in Cuba are just a, a legal ploy on its path to privatization? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the problem. That, that there's not enough energy being pushed into a cooperative energy of what, what's the socialization of cooperatives. There's not enough energy into cooperative education in Cuba. So that has to be more of a focus on that. And I think Raul is aware of that. And, you know, he, he's leaving in 18, so uh, depends a lot on the new, Who comes the new in. leadership. Mm -hmm. A lot of open questions in Cuba. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's well, yeah. clear. <laughs>
Um, Fabio, I wanted to ask you, you were saying that the, your findings have implications for progressive politics. I was wondering if you could articulate that. Well, that's one of the things that we always say, right? <laughs> no, I mean, jokes aside, I think a lot of, a lot of times um, the assumption behind or for people who opposed the Grafsky regime was that the family controlled everything. And to a certain extent, that was true. I mean, they managed eventually to, to purchase stakes of companies to, to meddle you know, with all sorts of resources in Macedonia. Um, but at the same time, they were not uh, that kind of stable dictatorship that was emerging organically out of networks of businessmen and oligarchs uh, that we see in other places, right? So they were not put in, in the same way. They, they didn't have the same kind of solidity. So, Paradoxically, um, they failed relatively, not quickly, but effort, well, not effortlessly, but without <laughs> bloodshed, right? So Finally, they, without bloodshed. Right. Um, which is something that doesn't always happen. There, there is a sense in which, you know, everything was forever until it was no more, in a certain sense, in, in a very, very specific way. So I think this is one of the reasons why, I mean, because the kind of networks that empower them uh, were financial networks that somewhat were related to the specific interconnection, but they were the, the strongest ones. Now, what does that mean? It means that there is also all sorts of alliances that can be created. Now, some people might think that you know connecting to the older oligarchs is not the best progressive move, um, but maybe there's other kind of not oligarchs where in power, nevertheless, this kind of networks can be exploited by to strategically at least. That is something that, you know, I don't think anybody has put on the table. I mean, nobody, none of the progressive have thought, hey, wait a minute, you know, who were the, the original uh, kind of enemies of the Grasco regime, and can we connect to them? Would they be interested in, you know, covertly uh, helping us in some different ways? And then, if so, can we get something out of them? I mean, this is one of the, uh, I think, interstices where um, one can think the other thing is, I think that comes back to what you were saying. Um, when we talk about financialization on the periphery, we tend to think about just a, a process of destruction, and that, which is definitely true. You, know, you definitely have that. But there is a sense in which finance on the periphery could have generated different futures, right? And I don't see that too much in my work because it's so much focused. Or because it's just me, probably. I just, I just collect the bad seeds, right? And, and I don't find the others, I don't know. But the point is that there was another option on the table. Not all finance leads to the same consequences. That we theoretically know. Um, here we see some of the specific, I think, features of the Macedonian path towards financialization, which are very political in many different ways. But there's others that talk about possibilities of finding uh, interconnected alliances, etc. So, you know, can we exploit those? Can we find ways to build on those sources of finance, those pathways to finance that were that were available at some point? Not sure, you know, that's still on the table politically, but you know, can we build towards that? Do you do you think that I mean you're you're making uh, you're making an argument also about that these security services, the intelligence services, are in some sense creating the new economy, right? This authority and this authoritarian politics. Right. Do you think this is a general argument in the post, like post eighty nine period? We see this as a possible worldwide thing that we may not be paying attention to. Do you see it happening elsewhere? Well, that's a very interesting question. So. Um, in the in the eastern part of the world, you see that definitely uh, in certain places, right? It's clear uh, in the Russian case. It's clear in a different sense in the Turkish case. It's clear, or at least it was very well. It's clear in the Bulgarian case, although the different dynamics. Um, but now you see various kinds of strange connections. So I left out all most of the juicy part about security services for various reasons. Time, etc. Um, but one interesting thing that you see now is that in, since 2008, there was a significant activity of Russia in, in Serbian intelligence in Macedonia. 
trying to push the country towards a uh, pro-Russian perspective uh, out of NATO, NATO um, kind of the gravitational sphere, and and at the same time, you know, you ask yourself, well, how long have those kinds of networks been there? Right? Yeah. Because some of the Serbian networks have a different kind of genealogy. They were not yeah. always pro Macedonia, they've always been there. Well, yeah. Right? So, so yeah, there what, was was after, what were they up to before? They were always there. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, at the same time, you see other places, uh, you know, in which the military has always been or still is part of the, the kind of statement in the state. Uh, Egypt is one of them. To places like the U.S., where you have a, a, an extreme presence of security services and all sorts of aspects of public and, and you know private life. In fact, it was interesting to see how the CIA saw the Yugoslav secret services or the Yukon, right? You have a trove of documents, in fact, Nassau, which are available online, in which the CIA describes the Yugoslav economy. I mean, their analysis is like incredible. They probably had you know various kinds of economists as well as intelligence officers looking at it, but they were te definitely testing each other, looking at each other, both politically, militarily, but also especially economically, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't have a sense of the extent to it, I mean, to which finance today is a consequence globally of financial yeah. decisions, <laughs> the consequence globally of uh, security services, but my sense is that finance allows for a centralization or, or makes it easier to centralize Power structures and so security services that are easier. Why do you why do you say that it's easier to centralize with? Well, because to a certain extent, you know, finance makes it easier to trade and to, to accumulate, and there is, you know, certain certain agencies can accumulate almost endless money, mm -hmm. uh, extend almost endless credit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is a sense in which it's much easier to create an equality. You know, you don't have to build a factory, wait until the factory produces or whatever else to have the profits. You can just use financial product and, and find a way to make them work for you. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you have parallelly a network of secret services that we're getting into the conspiratory part of this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do have ways to make sure that those markets work in your favor, the, the rate of return is, can be incredible. Right. I'm just wondering if your definition of finance matches Johanna's. I mean, hers was socialist finance, yeah, but right. I mean, and how much that matters for that kind of question. But then it seems to go back to the question of hard access to hard currency either way. Well, I mean, socialist finance is not typically the finance and financial solution that we see today. Definitely different. Yeah. I mean, we'd say there's capitalist finance, socialist finance would be separate things. Well, but it just seems like part of your argument is that this accumulate this kind of accumulation of power of the security services right. has to do with their ability to translate currency. That's right. Right? Which is that position in Yugoslavia has mm -hmm. to do with this problem of hard currency. Right. Which would be very different, let's say, than Romero's relationship to global finance, today, right? Like, right. Extreme. So I guess I'm just trying to think about, like, what are we talking? You know, like, sure. what formations are we talking about this question of security? Services? So I think, and, and that's something that came out in your talk. I mean, in order to have those kind of translations of currency, on the one hand, you needed at the point in time the two, the, the three different blocks, right? Which is something that you don't have in the same way today. So that, that's a different structure. But the Vemara is actually very much a conversion, or utilizes very much conversion strategy. So what they do, for example, take out all these loans, they convince companies that they're going to build, you know, hey, come build all these this buildings and we'll pay you, and then eventually they don't pay them. Or they pay them you know, months or years later, or they pay them with compensations or with, with things. So in fact, the Vemaro builds part of its power by the ability of converting international finance into forms of forced credit internally, and to, to kind of generate uh, various chains of forced credit. So they are still playing this kind of uh, 
not currency manipulation in this case, it's a different kind of value manipulation. But that's one of the reasons why I think they are so interesting and so much of their strategies today reflect this yes, kind of historical this kind of that's right. translation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is simply because Macedonia is, is this kind of right crossroad, uh, landlocked, which doesn't attract a lot of interest, you know, small, and so what you do, well, that's what you have, right? You intermediate there. Peripheral financialization. I yeah, think. that's right. So, so, so I, I think, I think the secret services and all of that come in in the moment that you call something peripheral financialization, mm -hmm. because there is there is friction, there is negotiation, right. there is there is overlapping of networks, and you have crucial connector roles, etc. Right. Um, but but then again, you know, you see different forms of perhaps of peripheralization that follow financialization or peripheral yes. financialization. So you know, in Italy, it would be. Well, maybe it's not a peripheral country, but it's no. peripheralizing right. in many different ways. Uh, the peaks have been peripheralizing for a while. If you look at Poland or other places, you can see a different dynamic as well, right? Poland did attract foreign capital. In fact, you know, almost went through the global financial crisis unscathed. So you have a diff very different kind of uh, forms of finance there. Well, maybe not there, not completely different, but definitely different. The, 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 the internal Polish story is exactly the other way around. So the Polish right, since 89, mm -hmm. has always argued that secret services were the crucial actors in the privatization to the West of the country's assets. And that's exactly why you have now a Polish right-wing government that has so much problems with, with neoliberalism even. Right. right? And the, so yeah, so it's interesting to see that, that peripheral financialism also generates a lot of different uh, yeah, conspiracy right. theories yeah, about mm -hmm. about the overlaps of finance and, and secret services, but but I don't think any one of them is universalizable. Right. I mean, these are really local accounts and significant in their own right. Yeah, I mean, to me, the interesting thing was precisely thinking about um, the political well, the, the the importance of politics here in many ways. And second, the questions of, well, what kind of reasons has uh, capital from Boeing or people from here to attract foreign capital? Why would they do that, right? Why in 2008? Why in 2010? Why not before? And so, and that is kind of, I think, you know, it doesn't necessarily produce a new theory of financialization in so far as we know, uh, but it definitely shows different paths or, or different ways of negotiating and talking about it. And, and let me just say what. Um, you could see places like Croatia and uh, you know Slovenia, which also were very much embedded into this kind of networks. In fact, there is one Slovenian author that apparently has done some study about this, uh, but you know, it's kind of like, it's, it's unclear always when you do studies on, on the connection to the secret services, who you're talking to, what are your sources. You know, it's it's, it's a very kind of but apparently their financialization took a slightly different route too, right? Any more questions, comments? Perhaps we should finish up. I think there's still a little bit of wine over there, but I would like to have a glass of wine. Well, thank you. This was, yeah, this was yeah. great. <laughs> thank you.